the whole thing about you being childlike, which, which crops up obviously endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. But nobody, as far as I can see, looking through the cuttings and everything, nobody's ever actually asked you why you think you're, you've remained childlike. I mean, is, is there a point in your development where you, you kind of made a conscious decision that you didn't want to grow up? And if so, no, then, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real misconception. I think people fool themselves. It's kind of like a... It comes across in interviews because people want me to mm. to be childlike. I mean, there's b- because of what I've done, I've allowed, and I, I've you know, I'd say I've been lucky, but I mean, there's an element of that. But I mean, I've kind of been fortunate, if so there's, there's any difference, in I've, I've put, helped to put myself in a position where I can keep part of my life as being very childlike. Mm. To an outsider, that's a casual observer, I have like, nothing to worry about. But in fact, in I mean, I run like the whole thing. I like, take all decisions relating to everything, and it's like I don't have anyone looking after me. Um, so a large, a large. So I mean, I, I'm childlike. I, I am in 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 respect of my outlook on life. But I don't even think it's childlike because I'm I'm like horribly aware of like the the, the pitfalls of, of life and like and the, the the meanness of of people. Which children aren't. You know, children are like mm-hmm. naive and like blindly innocent and just like enjoy things for what they are. I mean, I don't have that kind of childlike naivety anymore. But, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm determined not to be ground down by, by a, a, a notion of adult life, which I've not, never subscribed to and never will. I mean, I, I, I feel like, I mean, I, I can do all the things that I do and take all the dis- decisions I make and, and still retain a part of me as you know I just like I protect it I just keep it away from mm-hmm. which people say oh you're able to because you don't have to work but you know I always, always dispute that because mm-hmm. I mean I really love what I do but it's still, it's still it can be quite hard you know it's like working for, like, on something for 20 hours like, I don't have to and that's the whole point no one's telling me to do anything or I can say like, we'll pack up now and go home that's it it's all you know it's finished even that decision that like rests with me but so there's no one kind of like forcing me to clock on, but at the same time, I, I mean, I work because I enjoy it, but I do work, and, and children don't work, so. I, I do know what, 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 it, what it alludes to, and I think, a lot, I think everyone that, that is around me and, like the, and the people that I really get on with have that same kind of um, so a, a sense of wonder. I mean, it manifests itself in different ways, so like with Perry, and, and I have astronomy in common, and that to me is like is a way of like retaining like a childlike sense of, of wonder because I don't think you can ever get too old to kind of like just be awed by by looking at the stars and mm-hmm. and Perry's the same and so he has that but at the same time I mean, he's written, you know, he's dead grown up in other ways it's like he lives you know he, he looks after himself as well so it's a kind of it's, there's a it's a, a mixture of, like, of misconception and I suppose a, a certain amount of artifice as well on my part to, to kind of project that idea of you know the is it part of this difference between childlike and childish that, that childlike is actually something that is quite desirable in people I think yeah whereas childish yeah really I mean, isn't I mean, well, childish pe- is the tantrum yeah so people that. always um, I mean childlike is very rarely used and people that you use like one of like slag us off or slag me off, they will use childish, mm. um, without ever having met me of course, but, but even that, I mean it doesn't really matter, I mean being childish is alright, you know, if you do it around people that can put up with it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why they say you can afford to do it, isn't it? <laughs> if you do it around people that can put up But, um, no, I, I, th- I think part of it also is that in songs you're able to to look at the world with that kind of, with that kind of, I was going to say innocence, but I don't actually believe there is such a thing as innocence. Um, no, I mean, that, that's why I'm by artifice, and it's too strong work, because it's almost that, 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 it seems like I'm, I'm contriving it, but I mean, the, but I'm only ever moved to write words about anything from a sense of like either, you know, I mean, from, from extremes of, of emotion, and mm. that is a childlike quality. And that's what I mean by about it. That is ground down in people as they get older, usually, mm. unless something really tragic happens and then people kind of move to, to tears for a day, maybe, and then they kind of like just sink back into the, you know, their, their, their normal state of being, mm. which I have resisted. I mean, I, I would hate to just to, to feel that I'd reached a point where I was no longer moved to, 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 to write about anything. Mm. I'd have been. 
but that's I mean it's something that I've, I've you know I'm, I'm kind of prepared for. A lot of people feel they can't function in their lives if they leave themselves open to stuff like that. But mm, which again, people would say I'm lucky because I can. You know, but, but, but I, it doesn't matter if I burst into tears because. Mm. Well, you think, oh, he's just crying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a sense, your ability to have an income is founded on your ability to, to remain yes, open. it's to a strange kind of, paradox. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, if you couldn't do that, then, then you, would, you would be a labourer or whatever. Or, you know. yeah, or I'd be writing songs about, I mean, to, to, you know, and there's an awful lot of people who write songs that aren't, that, 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 that don't have emotional content in them, they're just kind of songwriters. Mm. And I mean, I could, I could do that. Mm. <laughs> it wouldn't be anywhere near as much fun, but I mean, say like what, what we've accomplished in like the Just last ten trusting. weeks. Yeah, it's, 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 and I mean, on this part, this side of Christmas, it's really what we've been doing. I mean, I've been kind of like structuring the songs and making sure they work, you know, tonally and like tempo-wise, where they go, what happens to them. But the stuff I'll be doing after Christmas is like what I, what I do on my own, which is like the, the words and the singing, which kind of makes the song into something hopefully more than it is at present. It's not just like a piece of music becomes a song. But I mean, writing music and, and, and writing words, but there are um, things that can be contrived. I mean, I mean, I have been guilty of the past, it's not a great sin, but yeah, right. I like playing with my nieces and nephews, mm. and that, that helps to but Michael Jackson got into terrible trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my nieces and nephews are a <laughs> pretty ha hard bunch. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not Michael Jackson. Um, I don't believe he did it, actually. No? Yeah. I do not believe he did it. I, I honestly haven't really spent enough time to form an opinion. About it, yeah. I just don't so I don't, there's no point because Simon's that so dead certain that he did that, oh, he, really? that he just goes yeah. mad at mentioning his name. So, oh, so I just play the oh, album I down. I think he just lives in such another world that, that he would actually get you know what, with no, kids. Yeah. Never, never you know what, I, no. I must admit, when it first came out, I thought, well, what, what's, what's wrong? I mean, I would never do it actually, because I'm not, you know, I'm not in another world like him, but I can actually take a step back and think, yeah, well, I can understand why he would, the only people he could trust to be people who would trust him back and not want anything from him apart from his friendship. Mm -hmm. and the only people that are going to do that are going to be like young kids. You know though, but uh, speaking of Make-A-Wish, I have lots of friends that have met him and spent time at his house and spent, yeah. it's just absolutely nothing. I, all you hear is, it was so good to them and, yeah. you know. Um, I know. Well, I don't think that he would like set up. I mean, it's a pretty fucking elaborate setup just to like get into bed with someone. And also, he's got so many people around. around inviting like loads and like, thousands yeah. of people around. I just, I just from the people I've right heard. Wacko. He's like, I think, I think he's, they should leave him. He's a strange person, I think, but you know, an unusual person. Yeah. I, but, I mean, I wouldn't I'd envy him. But I don't be him to like. Well, he's got everything. It's a horrific life. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's this. It's this. In some ways, he's got like got nothing. I mean, that's yeah. kind of like ripped away. Like what. Because now we can't even have the, like the friendships of, of children yeah. because their parents were like kids. I mean, it's, it's a, in some ways what's been done to him is, is quite evil, really. Yeah, I think so. That's but, um, what I think. I feel sorry for him, but I mean, I, I can't believe he's, he's guilty. Really. Well, all I've ever heard from Make a Wish and all the people I know, yeah. is wonderful things. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. It's saying it's right. I think. I think. I think you know. To, to, a child of that kind of existence at five, which is what happened to him. Yes. Yeah. It's hard to surprise me. It's criminal. It's criminal. Still, you laugh at this. Still, we've got Michael Jackson on that. How we get there? Well, actually, so, being an, un being oh, an uncle. Oh, you being an uncle. Rather than oh, yeah. a father, I think this helps right, keep me yeah. child. I think if, I, if I'd if taken it and had to children, I think I probably would have. I don't know. Mm. I, I think my responsibility is going to become too great for me to be quite as child ish, Good. childlike as, as I am. Mm. Because having said all that about taking decisions and stuff, I still feel that I, I, I'm, I'm not sort of responsible to anyone, but I don't expect that. I, I, um, how can I put it? I, I, I'm taking decisions that, that, that would affect other people, but I take them in, like, in good faith, kind of thing. I think about other people, but I don't feel that they should hold me down to being responsible for their lives. Mm which is the, one of the things that I'm doing this, I've got to realise over the last three months, that does wear away your childlike qualities. Mm. Every decision that you make, whether it be like what food you're going to have from the table or on, it's just like, <laughs> we have to have you know, someone's <laughs> going to be unhappy somewhere, and I have to kind of get the blame for it. So, um, but it's all right, but then if you, you, know, if you just laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do without repercussions of some sort. 
Um, uh, this question isn't here, but it's relevant to where we are. I mean, how did you come to be recording in here? I mean, is Jane Seymour's house sort of on the market as a, as a place where bands can come and record? And how did that happen? No. Well, after the, the well, in fact, before the Wish album, I, I wanted to buy their own stuff, like enough equipment to to record wherever we wanted. We were actually going to go on a boat in just somewhere and just record on a boat and kind of sail around England on a boat. But the costs involved were actually quite astronomical once we got we started to investigate mm. it practically and it would cost like more than me recording five albums in, in a studio. So yeah. we ended up like the, the best second option which was the manor, which was like a really nice, you know, very kind of locked away from the world, you get everything you want. But at the end of it we walked away and I kind of felt, oh, it's the, you know, there's another group following us in and in some ways it, it's, it upset me and I also thought, well, it's pretty stupid because if, well, in fact at the time it wasn't stupid. Well, like, the, like, like the next group was invading your yeah, home or yeah, whatever, yeah. That we kind of made it ours, just yeah. like we were there for six months and, and then we were like... you all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we were like, you know, discarded and forgotten like the next week. I mean, we actually weren't because like, most of the staff got sacked like, when we left. But um, I couldn't really aff afford to buy what we needed because this is like five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, technology was such that I would have needed like a, an Arctic truck to carry everything around and, like, and substantially more money than I'd earned at the time. Whereas now, the, the equipment, I mean everything that's in this house I've bought and it costs less than it would to spend like three months at the manor. Mm. So it just, apart from anything else, it makes economic sense. But more importantly, it meant that I could then look around. I spent like a lot of this year just kind of travelling around, looking for the right place to record. Mm -hmm. So I went to like loads of different houses. And, um, th this was actually just by chance because this is, this is on the market to be sold. And I happened and I, I heard about it from someone, and they sent me a cut in that was in some magazine. And I just thought it looked really brilliant. And it had the, a description of the ballroom and the orange room. And I thought. So it's a good house. Cool. So I came along just to like view it, and um, and in that intervening period, because we did the demos with as well as gradually buying the equipment, we were, we were doing demos in, in an old, like really run down house in East Sussex, and um, we were actually going to do the album there, but it was about a quarter of the size of this, and it was nothing like the same kind of scale, but big enough to, you know, it had two big enough rooms to do what we're doing here. Although the, the, the recording room is about this size, as opposed to like, I don't know if you've seen Huge the ballroom, room, yeah, it's like, lovely. But, um, and that's the library that we were in, presumably, where, where the mixing was yeah, yeah. So I, I, I thought, well, you know, I'll fall, fall back into, this, in, you know, into, into the house in East Sussex, but if I can find somewhere better, then we'll go somewhere better. And um, the people that were renting the, the house in East Sussex actually took on this house as, as Joan Seymour's agents. So it's just like one of those strokes of mm. good fortune. So you so didn't I, actually know Jane socially or anything? No, <laughs> no I've never spoken to her. Right. I still haven't spoken to her. All been invited have. to her in years <laughs> of party. Did she come she, on the she, she called. Yeah. Said, oh. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Yeah. Jane. She says, this is Jane Seymour calling. One of the great disappointments of my life, that woman. She, I remember the first time I saw pictures of her and I thought, gosh, she's gorgeous. And then the more you hear about her, the less you like her. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it, we, when when I came here to see it, I mean, it was just like a big old old house. There's like no one. She doesn't live here, mm -hmm. and it just seemed really tragic. I mean, we walked in, it just was, you could feel it was like really cold and so. But I mean, since we've all been here, it's kind of come alive. You know, the whole house is just like a really excellent place to be, and it's perfect. But the thing is, it's too. It's just too well known to, to buy it. I mean, everyone knows that we're here. Like around 20 miles, it seems, mm. those were here. Although we haven't really been that bothered. You're not being pestered. No. But the church, because the church is just there and it's like public access and stuff, it's not really a, a, mm. that private. It's fine when we're all here, but I don't really fancy living with the group for the rest of my life. You know? <laughs> I love them dearly, but. Yeah. <laughs> but I think a place this size needs lots of people in it, doesn't yeah. it? And in the old days, well, it would have had, wouldn't me it? Me and Mary actually came here for the, for the first two weeks of our let. Mm -hmm. to, just on our own because I wanted to come in and kind of sort things out and figure out what, what we were going to do and then um, just get used to the house and uh, it was pretty uncomfortable 
it's not. I mean, we lived in the library. Richard that was it. We yeah. lived in the library or the kitchen. You know, scuttled between the two rooms. We never came. I didn't even know this room existed until, until the group came here. Um, so it's like it's hopeless because I wouldn't. I don't. You know, I mean, we're like living with Mary, just the two of us. It's really nice. We've got just like a normal sized house. And, I haven't said that. It's, it's excellent for everyone to be here, like for a period of like three or four months, and it and it also means that we can kind of work how we want, and there isn't another group coming in afterwards. So she's going to sell the house. So that's kind of like... If she sells the house, happy to record it. <laughs> well, no, we've got it up until March, All right, and so then we've been kicked out. <laughs> okay. But though, so I must say that though that she got, um, she gave us a price for for it. And then was offered about five times that price for, this, for, for letting it to an American mm-hmm. company, and she stood by her verbal agreement oh, with us. So, and it's all right. So she's English in that. She'd be, <laughs> no offence, but I don't think if she'd been American, there wouldn't have no been offense, any, there would have, wouldn't have been a contest. Yeah, no, that's nice. It's nice. It'd be nice to. So I might be able to put something nice about her in the book. I'd rather. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you're going to put anything about she her, she has such at all. a nice name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I mean, I'm not doing that. I don't get anything about it. I get the impression. Her son likes this apparently. Mm. Plays trumps. He was keen for us to be here. Oh, <laughs> how but old is he? Her children were actually here the first time I was supposed to come here to to view the house, and I got here really late, and they had to, to go, they had to leave. Send them a copy of the album. Yeah. It's finished. Well, the house might actually be on the album cover. Yeah. We've got oh, this okay. arty photo of stuff in, in mind of her. And Anton Corbin sort of. That's when she'll demand the extra four fifths. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there there was no one. talk of my house appearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, when, when did that actually start? You said you and Mary came here at the beginning of the lap. When was the beginning of the lap? Um, the last. Last week in September, because no, the last two weeks, because we had a party. So it's Mary's birthday at the, at the start of October, and we had a party with her family, and then the group arrived the next day. Right. Okay. So, however long that is, I think it's twelve. I think it's three. Yeah, it's, it's twelve weeks this side of Christmas, and nine weeks the other side. Um, these questions are kind of zipping about backwards and forwards. There's no chronology to these. They're just right. things that came up while I was compiling the chronology and I kind of stuck them at the back. So um, let's go for the solo album. When you were working on it, before it mutated into disintegration, was the, was the band afraid that, you, that they were being deserted? And obviously I'm going to ask them this question yeah. as well. Um. <laughs> No, because I think well, the only, I think the only members of the band that would care if they were being deserted would probably um, Simon. I don't really think the others would have seen it. That way. I don't think Boris, Roger, or Paul kind of thought of the Cures in the same way. I think mm-hmm. they probably would have thought he's doing a solo album, he'll get it out of his system, and then we'll do an album. I don't think they're really worried. I think Simon would have been. Well, the one that would have been, been very able to see it more as a kind of personal. Yeah, thing. I think he would see it. He would have got very paranoid that you know I didn't like the group, so I was in a solo album. Because, because in a way, he's closest to you. Yeah, yeah. and kind of, and, it's, and it's, I think probably um, sees the group in the, in, the, in a similar way to how I see it, mm-hmm. which is sort of more than a group. And I don't think yeah. really that. Um, wow, it's Jane calling. It's Jane again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that the, um, Paul Flack. I don't think Paul Boris or, or Roger. I mean, they, I think they would admit it as well. Ever really thought of the group as as, as anything more than a group? You know, it didn't really symbolise anything, represent anything. It was just you know, it was it, not, not being horrible. It wasn't like yeah, I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering in what sense you mean it because it's, it's not well, like it was, best job of work. <laughs> in, in some respects, I think it was particularly to, to Roger and Paul. I don't really think they ever thought that that. Um, like culturally or in any sense, the group had very much significance. Mm-hmm. They liked other things much more than they liked the cure. Whereas with me and Simon, we don't really like anything more than we like the cure. We don't like any other group more than we like the cure. And I honestly don't. I mean, I, I think when we do things that are really, really good, they're as good or better than anyone else does things. I mean, we do bad things, but um, there is no other group that I think does consistently does things better than we do. 
So only if I did, I'd be, you know, it'd be terrified. Like, mm-hmm. like, I, I mean, I would be doing a solo album. I wouldn't be, be working with the group. Mm-hmm. I think Perry sees the group in the same way as me and Simon. I think Perry sees things from very, very much how, how I do about the group because he was like a fan of the group and kind of understands the group does mean things to certain people. I mean, I'm like, like a, globally, a handful of people, but um, you're always aware, you know, that if you let yourself down, you're also letting those people down as well. And, whereas I don't think Boris, Roger or Paul would ever believe that, uh, whether they would ever grasp the, the idea, because they liked things that weren't, you know, that were kind of very different. Mm. Um, so I don't think they, they would have felt deserted at all. I mean, I, I shied away from the idea of a solo album because I felt it was um, too much work and too kind of solitary, it's almost like writing. I, I, because effectively disintegration was an awful lot of it. I treated it as a, I treated it as a solo album anyway. Mm-hmm. I just had people around. That sounds really callous as well. I mean, everyone played on the record quite from long and played really well. I mean, without Roger, I mean, everyone derides Roger now, but without Roger, disintegration wouldn't have been a patch in the album that it is because his keyboard player is excellent. Our son's at home sick and that. We'd, no, we'd never done an album with competent keyboard playing before. And I think he really added a, a dimension. But he did it without really understanding what was going on internally. You know, he did, I don't think he really grasped what the songs were about. But um, that's perfectly possible, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it didn't, but it didn't bother me. It doesn't yeah. bother me now. I mean, it's, but, I mean, I, I, with, with Disintegration, I had a, a very, very strong idea of what I wanted the record to sound like and what I wanted it to be like. And no one was going to get in the way of it, so I don't suppose they bothered. You know? mm-hmm. they, they just kind of did what I wanted. Um, whereas with the Wish album, it's much more, you know, I kind of said, well, do what you want and I'll tell you if I like it. It's like that sort of yeah, idea. Different etiquette. I think it's nice that you take a different approach virtually for every album. You have a different kind of mental set. As well, Disintegration was all, I was 29 mm. when we started, 30 when we finished. And kind of, you know, I had a period of like, I think everyone no, does it at a certain age, they get like a kick. Like a keystone age sort of thing, yeah. and then I, I kind of went through a period of a month in the middle of doing the album where I just went completely berserk. Well, not since I'd done since I was like in my early twenties. Um, so I suppose I mean I, I I distinctly remember being looked at very peculiarly by other members of the group. Kind of thinking, oh God, you know, what's he? He's gone mad again. On now, you know? <laughs> and then and, and kind of playing up to it and thinking, yeah. and I, so, I mean, and I felt very sort of left alone. But in a, in a nice way, I think they felt sort of like you know, protective towards me. But I remember just, I mean, I slept in the control room and stuff. I just sort of lived the record for, mm-hmm. for like three months. Yeah. That's um, good. I mean, I, th- I method think. Method acting. For, yeah, for but a, I just, I, I, I thought, I mean, it was going to be like, you know, like my last will and testament record, I think, at the time. I well, you thought you were going to die, or? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's overly dramatic. I thought that that was that was it. I thought that was the, like, the that was the album. last Cure album. That was like you know that I I'd, I'd kind of exhausted all the possibilities of what I could do lyrically and within that framework of like being Robert Smith of the Cure. I thought that was it. I think that period around your thirtieth birthday is a period that deserves reasonably lengthy treatment in the book. Hmm. Um, just judging by all the things you've said about it in, in other interviews and things, it keeps it keeps getting referred to, but it never gets expanded on. As it went. And th- but there's yeah. a lot of things that, that you often refer to that don't get any bigger in the retelling. And I often, I often think, well, I, I actually want to know more about that. So yeah. there'll be several things will come up that, that I've noticed. You keep bringing up in interviews, but the interviewers don't seem to follow them. Mm. So I'm going to try and put well, it on from a personal point of view, it's very, I found it very strange because I, I always thought it would be 25, you know, because it's mm. like a really crappy sort of rock and roll thing. I don't want to stay alone, 25. But, um, it's actually like the closer I got to 30, like through my 29th year, I just had a real kind of sense of doom. Mm. Impending doom. Mm. Well, we'll so, which I could never shake like, for, for the whole year. That's kind of, and that's sort of like disintegration was just born out of that feeling of like, like, despair. Really. Where did you actually record disintegration? That. Uh, outside studios. Outside, and that's in Barks, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's called nearest... Hookend Manor, it's called. Hookend Manor Box. Yeah. So it used to... Uh, uh, What's the nearest town? The nearest big town is Reading. Or, well, it's actually... Uh, uh, what's the famous... Henley. Henley. It's right, it's the Henley. So it's George Harrison's house, apparently. Did you pop it in? Yeah. Uh, strangely enough, we didn't get invited <laughs> there, <laughs> right. Okay. 
because you talked about going out for a walk amongst the trees around where you were recording. Yeah. Um, and I knew it was called Outside Studios or whatever it was, but I didn't know where that was. So I just want, I want to it's um, I mean, it's very it's similar in, in setting and the stranger to here. Really? I mean, it's a but a very very different feel. I mean, the house is is um is old, but it's been modernised. And the studio is all brand new. And it's really, really clinical, which I liked at the time. I thought it was really funny because it was kind of. I liked the idea of just being in there, trend, you know, as a transient, and then yeah. being forced to leave. It appealed to me, which I did. I, I hate that at the moment. The night of my thirtieth birthday. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, disintegration. That album presumably goes back to this business of worrying about disintegration since you were 13. Mm. Yeah? Um, and and, and the, the quote is on page four about halfway down, if you, if you want to remember what, what you said about it in... Stop being back in court. Hmm? <laughs> Stop being back in court. I'm referring <laughs> you to <laughs> page four. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I didn't say that. <laughs> Overall. Misquoted. Yeah, I'll be hamburger. Too young to remember Penny Mason. I remember Penny Um Worrying about disintegration since you were 13. I mean, what does that mean? I mean, what happened when you were 13? That, that, I mean, did something happen that made you start to worry about disintegrating? I mean, it's, it is kind of a. Yeah, I, um, going, going to big school, kind of comprehensive. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of, the real world was something like there. I, I went, I was the first bunch of, you know, of the ones that went to mid, middle school and they invented that, like from 11 to 13, and it was dead arty and kind of like closeted existence. So sort of this funny English education system yeah. that I don't really understand You about. could do what you want, you know, it's like, I mean, oh, you, you could go, you could attend lessons if you felt like it, it's that sort right. of deal, you know. And suddenly like going to um, like a, a Roman Catholic comprehensive with a, Nazi headmaster. It's just that <laughs> thing I do. So it sort of kind of sort of started me thinking about, um, you know, I mean, I'd been reading books up to that point, which hinted, you know, books like that I shouldn't have been reading. So my brother would give to me that hinted at um, despair and disintegration. What, what, that, but that was all in the future. Remember what book? Um, I want I want books to figure quite a lot through yeah, this book I'm, because I've been actually asked to do something a, 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 um, a book. Thing next year in East Anglia, Bedfordshire Books Fair or something. To to do what? Um, Desert Island Books. Like to be interviewed on stage about oh, really? like ten uh, ten books really? I take to the Desert Island. And I was just thinking, God, I was desperately trying to think of like the books that I, that I read. Because I've been moving all my books at home, like, mm. and then there's like hundreds of paperbacks. And I think I've read all these, and I start like, looking at the spines of something. Oh, I can't remember what, I can't remember what this is about. It's really terrifying. But the thing is, if you worry too much about that, it's like you, you would never read again. You never do anything because you just like despair. You can't possibly remember. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was going to say Beowulf, but I was trying to think well, what. Well, that's, quite a, that's quite a despair. But I mean, sort of book, it, it, well, I mean, it struck me. I didn't really understand what was occurring. I remember, I remember him reading it to me when I was about nine years old, and um, just feeling really uncomfortable. Like, like, he used to come and after my dad had read this, you know, like the Grimm's Fairy Story. So, Read your cut of page from Beowulf because he was doing it at you know, college. And I thought, yeah. I sort of go to sleep with all these images of like men on burning rafts, you know, mm -hmm. with big fur coats. And, like. um, and some and Shakespeare as well. My dad always like, tried to like um, read Shakespeare as if it was like to be enjoyed. We used to like act Shakespeare out. But I mean, something like King Lear and stuff, I mean, it was like, it was gruesome, really. So I think. I was, you know, aware of like a darker side of human nature, and my old brother always used to allude to it all the time. You know, oh, you know, you'll understand when you get older, and I think, oh, no, I can have a vision when <laughs> I'm going to reach an age. You know. um, but I think it really like it, probably a change of score. I mean, at 13, it is like, and plus it's like an age where you kind of, you, you sort of, you, you're forced into decisions about your future at 13. Like, what you, are you going to kind of? knuckle down or are you not, you know, are you going to join in like the ones at Nickel School or are you going to start taking it seriously? Mm -hmm. You have to say, it's a, I think it's a point where you suddenly realise that, that you, are, you are going to grow up. Is it, is it a disintegration, an awareness of death and age and all that sort of stuff? Was that yeah, like, I mean, did, you work, did you sit at school or, or at home and worry about that kind of 
Yeah. Well, that's encouraging to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anyone that didn't. <laughs> Um, the disintegration, I oh, think, that, that, that started off, um, like, the, actually the, like the core of it was actually my, my, what I felt was my mental disintegration um, around that age. I felt that I'd, I'd kind of peaked in my early 20s and I was like on my way out. And it was that, that's why I thought like, disintegration was going to be a swan song. I thought I should never achieve these heights again. Mm. never be able to rhyme two words again. <laughs> Um, and also my physical. You've got books for stuff like that, Robert. Yeah, I know. They have now. Write them by rote. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for just the, the whole idea of like falling apart as well as you get older. You know, mm-hmm. You're just aware of your, your physical limitations and that you, can, that you can't do things that you used to do. Uh, uh, but we're, but we're, you've now moved on again to when you're 30 and you're, and you're thinking about this, aren't you? As opposed to when you were 13. Yeah, but I think it was. Um, yeah, I think at 13 it's still kind of, it's just like a vague kind of disquiet. It's mm-hmm. not really a, a genuine fear. I don't think, I mean, you're like, you're like endless poetry, but I mean, I look back and I cringe. I don't, I, I, I've still, I've still kept some of like the, my old, you know, when I was really young, stuff that I wrote, I wrote dreams and things and like that. Because um, I would never really, I, I would cringe. I never show, show anyone, like, you know, I didn't trust. I, I wouldn't ever throw it away and I wouldn't ever kind of, dismiss it because I, I've always had this idea of like myself at different ages of like key ages and what I would think of myself now so, you know it's like a kind of Doctor Who theory mm-hmm. of, you know the five so the, different, the, the five, five Roberts, Roberts. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now you go and it, and it, in a strange way it's a kind of like set, set of checks and bars that kind of like keep, keep me on this you know my yeah. own particular straight and narrow what would the 13 year old Robert have thought of what I'm doing I, now? he would be really really pleased I think now I don't think he would have been very um, enamoured of like the 25 year old Robert I think he would thought was a right dickhead as the 35 year old Robert does <laughs> <laughs> um, the 30 year old Robert was the scariest though without doubt 30 year old yeah, yeah. So you, you said that on the night of your 30th birthday you went home back to your mum and dad I just went completely off my head during the course of the evening. You mean you went out and got pissed, or, or what? Um, what happened? Well, I did a few, a few silly things, really. I, I, I took some drugs, and there's a... That's really stu- I mean, it sounds really stupid, but there's a park, and I'd grown up there, and in this park, they had a footbridge, and... I'd always wanted to drive over this footbridge. There was like a gravel path led up to it, and it was an ornamental footbridge, and it went. It's really steep. And it goes right up and down like that, like a, almost like a mono sort of thing. And then this like, this really steep hill ran down, and I used to play there like, like all through my teenage years. And for some reason, I just had this idea it would be really, really cool because it's like surrounded by a big block of flats, and there's all houses and stuff. It's like a small gateway into the park. And there's only one small gateway out the other side, and, and cars weren't supposed to fit through. And I, I figured well, you could definitely fit a car because I once saw a car in there that belongs to the park here. I thought, so you can get a car through that gateway. And uh, that's, I started off in the evening, and it was quite early actually. It was about sort of like nine in the evening, and I jumped in the car and I drove up to up to the park, and I drove through the gates and, and went over and I took paint off both sides of the car, that's how narrow it was to get the footbridge, and lost the exhaust part on the way <laughs> over, and went out of the park. And because the park's really near my mum and dad's, Mary was, was standing in, in the driveway, I mean, she was screaming at me not to go, not to do it, and I came back and, I and, and then she got a taxi home because she, she knew that it was going to be one of those nights. So. Mm. so that's how it started. So I thought I should do all the things in and around Crawley that I wanted to do when I was young, that I didn't dare to do. So I just went and like a so bit of a spree. Mary sounds to me like an inordinately sensible human being. <laughs> yeah, well, she knew that she's like, um, she didn't stand a chance of stopping me. Mm. And she knew she's just going to get more and more upset. So mm. she's seen it before. So she went home, mm. phoned up the next day. It's a, good, it's a good scenario for a movie, somebody who decides to go back to their town, isn't it? Yeah, well, in fact, the things, but I mean, I knew I was doing it because I knew why I went home. I went home in the afternoon and I sat down with like, my mum and my dad and started talking about, you know, like when I was young and so my dad got homemade wine out. And I mean, that's completely bollocks, but it's like six in the evening. Mm. So, did you tell them you were going to do this? No. No. It's it's got up and, 
I didn't. I, I mean, I, at the time, I mean, I still remember screaming at the top of my voice when I was driving up to it because I thought if I don't make it, <laughs> this is going to be a really terrible, jarring impact as the car like smashes into the two pillars on either side of the bridge. Mm. And so actually fitting through it, and then it was like a real sense of exhilaration. It's like yes, it's just one of those moments. I mean, you know, it means nothing. But it's one of these things that, that because you were about to become therapy, it was like I'll either do it now or I never yeah, will do it. Yeah, well, I thought that's you know, this is my one excuse. When else am I going to? I mean, I thought well, if I ever get to forty, I'm not going to want to do it anymore. And it's like, even at the time, it was, it was just fueled. Actually, you know. Has the town council sent you the bill yet for uh, fixing? No, the... it was in the paper. <laughs> it was in the paper because the people in, from the, the flat blocks. Um, Phoned the police, but they didn't know who, who'd done it. It was just a small. Uh, I've got the, the cutting. What if they had found out who done it? Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if, you're, be, if, you're, if, you're, if you're if you're happy to uh, to admit this in the book, <laughs> then it would be great to get that cutting out and, yeah. put, that, and put that in the book. And say, "It were me." Mate. Yes, I was, but tell my mum on it first. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you I remember when uh, I'll put the, it in. You can decide whether to take it over. The, um, the, the swimming pool at the, the, at the middle school that I helped build was um, all the time we were there, it was like child labour looking back. They used to say, Oh, you have a lifelong pass to go swimming there if you help build it. And we like, we used to go there at weekends and dig the swimming pool. And I went back when I was about 15 and, and one afternoon and they wouldn't let me in. I said, like, Hang on, I've got a lifetime stint. And the, and the head mistress who was there said, oh, just, you know, that wasn't, you know, if that was true, you know, we'd have hundreds of people there. I said, what do you mean if it was true? She goes, no, well, we had to say something to get her, you know, parents let all the children out. I said, this is despicable, you can't do that. I, said, I, I demand to be led to swim pool. I'm terribly sorry, you can't come in. So later that night, I went back and I broke into the swimming pool. And I, this is your 30th birthday night again? No, this is my 15th. Oh, right, right, and I, right. And I just swam about and I didn't do, do anything, but I used a towel. I was quite drunk and I... And I left the towel in the heat and I thought I'd just kind of rearrange everything, didn't turn any lights or anything and I left all, all as it was and that was in the paper and my mum, but they really blew it out of all proportion, they're saying like um, vandals hit swimming pool and like you know uh, 35 pounds worth of damage or something, you know like towel left in shreds and I said it's, it's a lie, there was me on my own, I left a wet towel and I remember my mum sitting there going this is terrible, Look, this is the pool that you helped build and I said, and I said oh really, oh yes. <laughs> Right up. <laughs> In those moments, I could see her looking at me thinking, Oh, thinking, God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you were there just the other day, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So what other bizarre things did you do then on the night you had left you? Um, I went into Crawley Town Centre. I, I smashed a shop window. It was the other stupid thing that I did that night. I shot the manager of him and thrown me out few years before mm-hmm. and I knew still managed the shop. What was this before you through you before you were famous or um I don't think I'd ever been famous in Crawley really. <laughs> it was in my early twenties, so it's probably about seven years before. Oh. It wasn't really a grudge either, it's just like it was a really it was a ship sort of menswear shop. Mm. I had I'd actually gone in with someone and they just chucked me out. I just it it was like a symbol of all that I thought was wrong with like, Crawley. But actually, what was wrong with Crawley was me breaking a window. It was, it was pretty stupid. Right? Yeah. You could be in for a lot of bills if you print this. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was it. And then I just, I, I, um, I wanted to, to like, just run around the park at the, mm. at the by ask by the school that I used to go to. Just because it was. What? Well, there's a different park than the one. Yeah, yeah. There's like there's a park at the back of the school, but the comprehensive, and it was just stuck and. I mean, it was really like Dead Poets Society, really. It's just like revisiting, you know, like keep up, because I'd grown up in the same town, you know, for sort of 20 years. I just like wanted to kind of go, I thought, like one last time sort of thing. So I just packed it all into one evening. But, um, I didn't get up for like about 48 hours. I was shattered, yeah. Because I took my shoes and socks off and stupid things that, you know, I thought, like, if I get arrested, I don't care. So I was like wandering through town. It was actually more like American werewolf than. Sorry, you described it as English werewolf in Crawley. Yeah. So you said, you said you ended up about six in the morning just in just a pair of jeans in the middle of Crawley trying to find my way home. Yeah, that which was quite worrying because I realised that, I, you know, when you see you start seeing milk floats, you think, oh, it's like time, to, time to get home. <laughs> and uh, it took me ages to get home. By the time I got home, there were like commuters 
it's really embarrassing. Mm. And he said, but, but it was good. I came to terms with a lot of things. Did you really? Well, yeah, I kind of, it's just, I'd got rid of a lot of idiot things that I wanted to do just in one night. Mm-hmm. That kind of, and the things that they're not, so even talking about them, it's not, it, it, they're kind of irrelevant, really, because it's one of those things I always find quite strange about, about being asked questions about, and, and I answer because I'm asked. Um, but, but if I was normal, no one would, I would still have done it. You know, it's not because of who I am. And that the only people that would know would probably be Mary and maybe Simon and a couple of other people. It would just be like, oh, you know, remember that time you did such such and such. When Mary remembers it, it's just been really, a really horrible night. She, she lay awake all night worrying about you know, mm. what I was going to do because I, she didn't, I wasn't going to you know, end up the night by like, throwing myself out of a window or something. But um, it was just, I, I had to get rid of, you know, they were just like, it was like a symbolic evening. Nothing mm. that actually did meant anything, but I just I wanted to prove to myself that I could still do things without a good reason, I suppose. It was that more than anything. I know these were just, they happened to be, you know. Had I been on tour or something, I would have, you know, I would have chosen different routes. It mm. probably would have ended up throwing myself out of the window instead of getting on tour. Make sure it's a ground floor window. What was a good idea? Yeah. Um, I saw someone throw himself at a ground floor window once. It was really funny at <laughs> a uh, party. Yeah. They thought they were in a bedroom. It was like a. You thought they were upstairs? Well, it was a ground floor flat. I was in a bedroom and actually threw themselves. It was like a twist there. They were trying to get out the window to throw themselves out. They said, but they said, like, you could see roses. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty feeble suit there, Tim. Yeah. Um, right, okay. That, that, that's kind of filled that night in, but then, because it, it just seemed that, that that did seem to be a sort of a critical evening, um, and it did want a bit more, a bit yeah. more filling in. Really. Although the night I remember from around Disintegrate, that's the most vivid night, it was, um, it was bonfire night mm. at, at the studio, because I'd, I'd gone back and Mary had gone into hospital for an operation, and, and uh, I went to visit her, no I took her to the hospital and I left what, her there. She had something wrong with her eyes, she had to have an operation in her eye, and, and she was really scared. And I took her to the hospital and I left her and I came back to the studio and I got a lift back to the studio and I, and I took, I dropped, dropped some ashes on the way back to the studio and went to a shop and bought loads of fireworks and had a really like wild bonfire night and I felt so remorseful when I said I came to the next day because I'd completely forgotten about it. It so terrible. You'd forgotten about I'd forgotten about Mary. Take Mary to us all, yeah. And she'd already had the operation, I thought, okay. Mm. So that sort of self-loathing kind of fuels, you know, mm. how can I be so horrible? Mm. Right. Yeah, yeah, you don't... You do, I mean, everybody does a lot of things that they... without thinking of what the consequences are, don't they? Yeah. Know, like, you know, like dropping out. But I think <laughs> that some, <laughs> some of the time I do things and I think at the back of my mind I know what the consequences are going to be. And I almost do them to kind of... To try and break things. Mm. Do you do you do things and to make your life difficult in order to have something to write about? I think I have done that. Yeah, definitely in the past. And looking back, I've done things that are like I've, I've had had I, you know a choice between A or B, both equally as attractive, and I've chosen B because it's going to cause more grief, mm-hmm. and for no other reason than that, just to see what the experience would be like. Can you think of examples? I can't, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I ask because, funnily enough, because Eric Clapton said in an interview with me that, um, that he'd done that, that he had mm. ditched girlfriends, that he'd been going out with for quite a long time in order to feel miserable enough to write the, the, I've, the I've Lost You song. I mean, yeah, it's classic. I've, stuff, no, I've, I've, I've never been that it, obvious, let's say, yeah. about. I thought it was very good of him to admit it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, looking back, I, could, I think I can explain some of my more inexplicable actions that, because I think, ah, oh, you know, at some point a good song's going to come out of this. But I don't think I would, I mean, I wouldn't really like jeopardise my, my personal life just for the sake of writing a song. I'd rather not write a song. Mm. Like, um, but I mean, I, I think it's more that I would put myself in a situation that could be, you know, that could jeopardise, you know, other relationships or my own sanity, mm. you know, just for the sake of the experience. Um, but I don't think I've ever got to the point where I, where I um, 
because I, I spent an awful time with my, when I was at school. My best friend's dad used to. I remember one Christmas I was around and he, he would say to me, like, you, "You're like the watcher." He'd go, "All you do is like watch people. You observe people. It's like you never join Fantastic in. Four, that yeah. watcher, yeah. And I just like, thought, oh, and I thought no one noticed that I did it, and I, and I used to do it. I was just like, and I'd join in enough, you know, so people would notice. But I'd always be like observing, like seeing how people acted. And it's take, taken me years to kind of get rid of that and to actually like immerse myself in what's going on at the time. And I still find myself kind of like drifting away and just like watching. And I think, and I don't, don't, because because I, it's it's a terrible thing to to like because you you can't. What I'm trying to say is you can end up. Kind of like living vicariously and actually just like taking material for songs and becoming a songwriter. And, and that, because that's not what I want to be. I mean, I would, would much prefer n never to write another song and enjoy myself than, you know, I, I don't think, God, I've got to write a song, but, you know, where's my angst going to come from? So, yeah. Because I don't have that, that need. I mean, the, the need to write songs, either, either it, you know, it, it's there or it isn't. I, I think to kind of manufacture it is, is, is pretty. Tragic, really. But I think this observing thing is quite well. I hope it's quite normal because I mean, I I, I find that if, if you're in a group, it's like talking one to one, you're, mm -hmm. you're immersed in the conversation or whatever, and, and you know, two or three people, you, you're still immersed in what's going on. But I find that if if I'm in a group of people, sort of six or seven people in somebody's house, I tend to slip into that role of mm -hmm. because you quite often can't find anywhere to logically interrupt the conversation you're quite enjoying what's going on so you sit and watch it almost like a tv program i mean that, that, that doesn't seem to be wrong to me it's fine <laughs> you're on my side then yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. well just in well, case you were worried just in case you were worrying about it you know? so. he used to think i had some kind of ulterior motive for it and i said and i actually had that that reason it's a very similar reason i just like could, if i couldn't think of anything to say i didn't see any point in really just like interposing to be part of the conversation be part of the group it was like it, everything's ticking over very nicely without me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing is like I just read in fact the book that you no, gave me that book trivia. It's got some uh, excellent bits in it. In that then, I just I I gave him a, a book I found in this old in Stratford upon Avon. There was this like little old lady that had like ten rows of books and they were all like dictionaries and things from like 1988 or something. But like at the very bottom, all dusty and dirty, was this one little book. Like it's like hand published by a book called Logan Pearsall Smith. I've never heard of it. It's supposed to be his only book. So a kind of mini diary, just through a period probably of like 15 years, just that like extracts from his thoughts on life and like yeah. his yeah. role in it. But um, that just made me think, well, I'm going to forget it now. Um, I'm sorry. What was I talking about? <laughs> Where did I get to that? The book. And... Your best friend's dad. Well, being the watcher. Yeah. And your best friend dad did think that was odd. About not bumping into a conversation. Oh, that's right. What I was going to say, he he's got this this just this one piece. So just like snippets in it, and something like oh, once again this evening I, I and there's a dreadful thing happening. It's like in a, a dinner party conversation, like going ticking along nicely, and um, a goat goats were mentioned, and I told the story about the goat at Portsmouth. Hideous silence. You go, an even more dreadful thought. Every time goats are mentioned, do I really tell the same story about the goats? Of course. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I know that thing. See, yeah. I saw that book and I immediately thought of you with like all oh, the just a little. It's good. It's got some another really good one though, where it, 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 it's um, it's really happy and it's, it's just uh, yeah, actually I won't sum them up because it's the way they're written. It's, it's really good. But it just finishes at the end. He says, "How oh, dare anyone say I'm drunk." And the whole thing is like self-mocking that he's yeah. like at one with it's everything cute. and he feels really strong and like he's really witty and stuff and he actually knows he isn't. I only read a couple of those little ones. Good. I photocopied like a load of um, about 10 or 15 pages out of it to, to give to you, which I think like the, the best things. The oh, early good. ones, when he's, when he's obviously younger, are a lot more kind of very worthy. Yeah. But as he gets to uh, older, in fact they're really, really sad, the last few in the book, but there's some where um, he's kind of, I don't, I, it must be kind of like either early this century or late last century because it's kind of, it features vicars and bishops and stuff in it. and he must be quite well off, he moves in those kind of circles but doesn't feel comfortable in it and um, he's at another dinner party and they're talking about Lord, you know, they've got like Lord K, who's just a 
the young Lord K is only 21, he's just inherited a fortune, his father's just died, and he's inherited all the estate, and everyone's saying, oh, you know, it's terrible what he's doing with these throwing wild pies and stuff, and they did the rounds, and everyone's saying, following each other and saying how much more terrible it was, and how they spend the money in a much more worthy ways, and it got to me, I was just about to join, and I thought, well, what would I really do if I didn't know that? And he said, I think Lord Kay's doing a splendid job, I said, no, all this stuff. This debauchery is wonderful, is it? And the look on the bishop's face, you, know, so you can't buy that look. <laughs> that excellent. So, if you get any songs out of it, you have to tell oh, I've got one already. Which one? I'm you not tell telling me? you. You won't tell me! You have you'll to get, tell me! When you get the record, you will get the new read the photo copy. You'll, you'll ah, so, so is that true, though? Yeah, there's one song after There's it. some excellent titles ah, for songs. See, Jane Granby is responsible <laughs> well, hang for on. this one. <laughs> Well, a couple of lines. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, an idea for a song came no. from it. I just thought no. it was. The trouble with reading something like that is that, that, that he's actually put it far more succinctly than, than and if you try and actually like, expand what he's reduced into one page and you try mm. and make something more out of it, it becomes less. Because the fact that it's really good is that he's just diluted the essence of like a moment. They're he's really explained short, the stars aren't they? to someone, to this girl, and he's trying, obviously, he's just trying to like, chat her up. And he said, and he catches himself explaining scientifically what the stars are, how far away they are, and how long it takes for light to reach us, so they say. And he catches himself mid sentence and thinks this is all absolute nonsense, I don't know what I'm talking about. Mm. And just walks off and leaves it there. Have you seen The Lion King? I haven't yet, no. Oh, you'll, you'll like it in that case. <laughs> I stick my fingers in my ears when Elton <laughs> John comes on. Oh, forget Elton John, I mean, he's irrelevant to it. You're not even, I don't think he wrote the songs. I honestly don't mm. think he wrote the songs. They're, they're too much like classic Disney songs for him to have written them. So just just forget all that. But there's, there, there's a looking at the sky sequence that you'll love in that case. I mean, there's, there's a very funny, I shall tell you, the punchline. <laughs> it's very like that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Um, Right, so let's forget this integration for a bit. But um, when did you actually move out of Medeville? Mid-1988, mid was it? Um, yeah, well, we got married in August 88. That's when we moved out. Alright, oh, so you got married when you moved out. You got moved out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're moving out, let's get married. Yeah. He said, you have to tell him. I was talking gem, oh, right. gem call. And... Um, if, if, earlier when we were waiting for you and he um, I was just saying oh yeah I'm kind of telling him what I had done well yesterday I went down to Bognor Reed Regis with uh, Nick to go get to get to go get Mary and, and um, came back and so I get off the phone and he goes so, I said did you say you got married in Bognor Regis yesterday <laughs> <laughs> you thought I had gotten married <laughs> that wasn't the straight I really do Hello, Dad. <laughs> yeah. I got some good news. In the good news is I'm married. The bad news is in both my ages. Um, were there any other, any other possible titles for disintegration? I mean, or, or did it was it always disintegration? Uh, the album. Was there another title? I'm trying to it was ten, one million virgins kiss me, wasn't it? I think disintegration was always disintegration. It was always disintegration. Yeah. Okay. In fact, the, the, the album title came before a lot of the songs. Yeah, before the yeah. When, did you say in that last lot that you were saying just now, but when that title came to you, that was one, that was one of the things Well, I, 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 I'm lying actually in here about the, um, I think, do I say that was the night I wrote disintegration, that isn't true. Mm -hmm. Does I, I wrote disintegration on whatever the tour was that preceded my 30th birthday. Right. Um, well, you've, you've, yeah. When would that have been? Uh, or was I on, was I been on tour? Well, it was, you've been, yeah, you've, not long before you'd been in Europe on tour. When disintegration was? The tour? The prayer tour? When was it 30? You were 90, 90 on 91. Eighty-nine. Uh, no, Eighty-nine. September. I saw you in September of nineteen eighty-nine in America. I was thirty in eighty-nine because I was fifteen. I was one in. Are you sure? Because I've watched it out as being April the twenty-first, eighty-eight. I was born in nineteen fifty-nine. 
I was one in 60. I'm always one ahead of whatever year it is. You're as good at maths as I am, then. Yeah, so in <laughs> 69, I was 10. 79, I was 20. 89, I was 30. 89. But, 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 yeah. disint- but disintegration yeah. came out in 88. Yeah, that's why I'm lying when I say that I wrote some on my 30th birthday. You wrote it before it. Much before. Of course. We recorded through October, November, December, January, February, for 88 into 89. Right. I was approaching my 30th birthday when we were doing disintegration. I wasn't yet 30. Right. So my cathartic 30th birthday that like, had nothing to do lyrically with what went on disintegration because it had all been done. I was still writing words with that B side and stuff, but the, the bulk of the album had been done. You there? Bites of dust. Which no. which one is this? This is the pop, the. This is a dancey one. I like this one. This is a pop song, is it? Yeah. At the end of '87. You just said the words to disintegration were written on the kiss meter. Yeah. In, well, in their initial form, right. went for, like, after we'd finished the tour of America in 87. Right. And that was the start of, like, and through 88, we did, I was doing, was like, that? home demos, and we were doing demos down at Boris's, and that's when I met you, I think, right. in 88. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I was... Was that the first time? No, that was the second time. Yeah, because yeah, you yeah, came to the film. Right, yeah, because yeah, we, did, we did two lots of demos at Boris's house in the summer of 88. And we started recording for real, I think, in September or October. Yeah. Where'd you record that one? What? Kiss Me. Mirabelle in France. Great. Mm. Okay. Oh, I love uh, you guys are in France. France. France, sorry. <laughs> France. As in Chris France. <laughs> um, it's because it's got like, it's lullaby right. and <laughs> love song. And Why it's interesting. You know, I mean, if it didn't have those songs, if it was the the the, the why it's like a hundred times better than pornography, I, I think it's because it's got pop songs on it. Mm. Pornography didn't, and it's like because it, it's like it's an old cliche, you right, know, light and shade. But it, particularly with the record, it, it works. I mean, my favourite records, even like a Nick Drake, my my favourite Nick Drake album was like Five Leaves Left because it's got like Man in the Shed mm. and a couple of other songs that, that kind of like lift you out of the morass, whereas. Mm. I think people say, oh, Pink, you know, Pink Moon's like his best record, because, but I mean, it's too uniform, it kind of, I don't know, because you can't see how sort of gloriously tragic something is, unless you, like, you laugh in one minute, you know? I like all that, it's like, really good well, records kind of like drag you about a bit, they like, yeah. it's like good horror films always have very funny bits in them as well, yeah. Yeah. and it, yeah. it's the combination of the two that really gets your emotions seesawing around, yeah. so I don't, I don't know, I mean, I think that the, um, I mean, a song like that is there, well, apart from the fact that I think it's just like a really catchy sort of song, and I like listening to it, and it puts me in a good mood. Mm-hmm. I can imagine like, listening to that next summer and kind of thinking, oh, it's like, you know, it is good to be alive. <laughs> well, that's, what, that's what I like about this one, it kind of feels like that. Yeah. It's kind of like... And it's nice, and some of the other ones at the same time, I could think, well, they'll suit me when I'm feeling a bit. Yeah. It isn't. You're, you're always stressed. The, the importance of a song is, is the emotional content, the, the emotional commitment. Presumably you put the same emotional commitment into a song, whether it's happy emotion or, or miserable Yeah, emotion, the, or the, the thing is, I remember on driving home from um, the Wish, when, when we were doing the Wish album, it was getting towards the end, it was like after month four, and I listened to the tape of what we've done and I thought, what we really need is like a really catchy pop song. And that night when I got home, I started singing to myself. And when I got home, that just sounds like a really corny story, but I actually wrote Friday I'm In Love. And, the, and I thought, while I was doing that, I was thinking, well, I could sort of Music hear or lyrics? The music. And I thought, oh, this is, this is going to be a really catchy song. I sort of knew it, because the tune had stuck in my head all the way home, despite that I was listening to things on the radio. And I thought, that's, that's, that's a good sign. Um, and the next day, as I was driving back to the studio, I thought, right, I've got to convince them that it's a really good pop song. 
So I thought, what should I sing about? And I, and I just thought, oh. and it was actually a Friday, and I was thinking, oh, I'll sing about how good it is. It's got, because I felt really good. So I got this really good song done at home, and I was like driving back, and I was looking forward to it. We were going to the pub, and I thought, it's, it's a great Friday, you know? So that's like the germ of the idea. But, and I wrote it in like about half an hour, and, but, which is really extraordinary, because I, I very rarely write anything like, like that. But it took ages for me to get it right when I was singing it. Not just like li lyrically, but actually like to make me sound right when I was singing it. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't get it right. Like, there's other songs in the album, it's like ten times more difficult to sing, you would imagine. Um, like Trust or something, really, you know, like very emotional songs. I just couldn't get Friday. I couldn't get myself into the right frame of mind. Every time I came out and listened to it, I thought, no, you're faking that. You're not, you're not that happy. You're not and it was right you're near the end. end and it's like really throwaway. In fact, we already started celebrating the end of the record, and I was going to do the vocals like sit in another studio. And I thought, God, I could sing that song now. I just had like one of those things, and I just like did the whole song in one go, and it's like the, the song suddenly, you know, it was it. And it was like, oh, that's it, that's the pop song. Isn't it? So in some ways it was contrived, but in others it wasn't. So you're right, and I, I couldn't do it. I think, oh, well, you know, we'll get away with it because it's. It is, a, you know, it's got a catchy tune. The lyrics work. It's going to, you know, it'll get played on the radio. But I thought, but I want to be able to listen to it, and that's what I always think about what we do. I thought, if I listen to that and it doesn't make me happy, then what's the point in doing it? Yeah. Whereas now I've listened to it and I hear it and I think, and it actually makes me smile because I think, oh, I remember doing that, and I was in a really, really good mood. See, I think that's why. So I if like, I wasn't, I'd... that's why I think I, I like the really, I enjoy the really happy and ones because because when I'm. I come over and I have such like an incredible time over here. I'm usually, you know, it's like my happiest time coming over and do, doing all this for a week or whatever. And so those songs kind of remind me of you, you know. Maybe, maybe that sounds really corny as well, but it's true. But everybody has songs that remind them of times, uh, yeah. and people, and places. It's great. It's we live our lives by them. Yeah, but I, I mean, I still do with, with us. I mean, like you keep your book. I mean, yeah. The, the, when I do a vocal, I think that's it. I only get one chance. You know, once this record's out, I can't go back. So oh, actually, I didn't mean to do it like that. I want to do it a different mm. way. Um, I think I have to like know myself, and I listen back to it in years to come. That's you know, I remember doing that. I can remember doing almost every vocal on every record. I can't remember like hardly anything about you know, anything else to do with it. Like, you know, when did we decide on that snare drum sound? Well, that's like completely irrelevant. But the vocals, like, the, for me, it's like the key part of the record. It kind of make, makes or breaks the songs. I mean, some songs. We've, we've, we've done it, been really good, but I just can't get the vote right, and they, that's it, you know. They, they, their, their lives stop there, sort of thing. Mm. This is presumably where, where the, the cassette of instrumental stuff came from, isn't it? Because that wasn't yeah. intended, that, that wasn't intended, that was things for which the vocals presumably did, yeah. it, but they were such nice pieces of music, you didn't want to lose them. Yeah, well, we did, we, I mean, we, we were actually, record, we, when we set out recording the Wish Album, we were intending to do a second album, like, concurrent, mm. of them. Um, Late night jam sort of stuff, which never came out. Although we've got a couple of things that are really excellent. I've got on DAT, which is like sort of like two hour, just bashes, you know. So with the DAT, like DAT, two hour. The DAT runs out and we're still bashing away. It's Good like, God. Um, we've had a couple of those here. It's actually the Grateful Dead here. Yeah, <laughs> a couple of the drummers have been well into it, and I suggested that we had one night. And that we had one night just me and Perry, didn't we? The, the well, was, I, I yeah. was dancing. <laughs> that counts as something, doesn't it? He had to, one, one of the jumps, and we played till about like eight thirty in the morning. Then he went off to, to do a concert. That, is, is it, you guys, I went to bed at seven in the morning, and I think you guys we played like a half an hour rocking. and a half an hour longer. And you had started before dinner, because yeah. for the first, and you did like three tapes before dinner. Then we had dinner, and then I went back in, and you played until I seven. I enjoy myself too much at night. I think you went to bed. Perry said you went to bed about a half an hour after I did, but. And I went to bed about seven, a little after. But you, are you getting more back into playing guitar because there was a phase where where you kind of less than. Oh, I have to. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of. It's kind of what I'm trying. <laughs> there is no one left. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean. Well, I mean, the other the other option is to is to audition more yeah. guitarists. No, I mean, I like I like again. It's one of those things. I like. I, the the funny thing about the Wish album is a lot of people thought. That, that like all the guitar solos and stuff was Paul, but in fact they're all me. I just let's do it under the cover of Paul, so I didn't get ridiculed. You know? And Paul did it on stage, so which suited me fine, because I just couldn't do it on stage. I mean, I couldn't do that in front of people. Mm -hmm. um, Why not? What's the difference? 
I just I feel really, really, I feel much more self-conscious like if I was to do a guitar So If I'm in a forest, I can live with that, because nice, that's an adventure. But, you know, like things, you know, when Paul's got her kind of like, he's got the right moves and stuff, you, yeah. got, you just can't, you, you either can or you can't do it, and I just can't do it. But I, um, in the studio, and that's really good. Mm. I love your guitar player, I really, really enjoy your yeah. guitar player. Uh, yeah, well, I'm nothing against admit, Paul's, I, like, I love Paul uh, playing as well. But you, the, the think about it, there is, a, on stage, I remember on the, on the Kiss Me Tour, I did, we used to, like, we opened with um, the Kiss, didn't we? It was like all a while, our sort of frenzy workout. I used to really enjoy doing that. Because it's like heads down sort of music. But, um, that's what we were, we were doing the other night. I've done a song here, which is just like sort of five minutes of me playing well. But in fact, I did that on the Wish album as well. Yeah. Cut. Well, there's, there's, a bit in, there's a bit in that track, or quite far on into it, a couple of minutes into it, where there's a link comes in and it's so you. Yeah. I, can't, I, can't, I can't remember, I, mean, I, couldn't, I couldn't replay it to you now, I couldn't tell you what it was, but it just comes in and it's like, it's like hearing an old friend. It's like, it's like running into somebody unexpectedly. You say, oh yeah, that's Robert. <laughs> and it's nice, it's really nice feeling. There's, there's quite a lot of the guitar, the guitar player that's going on there that could almost be any good guitar player. Yeah. But every now and again, something comes out and you go, oh yeah, that, that's definitely him. <laughs> it's nice. No, I do, I actually, I'm, I'm relishing playing guitar, I must admit, on this record. So they take the piss out because I've got so many guitars like, and I've never played a lot of them up till now. Mm. Uh, it's got 30 odd guitars with like range. Really, really like yeah. So I just come to tell, tell you my very unfunny joke for the day. Yeah. What's Bruno's favourite soap? Hang on, hang on. I don't know. Hom and a gate. Bruno's favourite soap. I'm, I'm in the way. Hom These gate. jokes are, are, are in the way of a kind of test. <laughs> <laughs> a challenge. I don't know what home and away is. It's a programme on television. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, <laughs> I was actually going to say coal tar. I was trying to coal tar, palm olive. Yeah, I was thinking of Roger and Gavin. Soap, soap, soap pots variety. Soap pots Good. <laughs> Thanks. Guitaring, yeah. So, so is it, is it, is it a more guitar album? No, the, well, strange enough, this record, I had a really fixed idea of what it was going to be like. Mm. And we were doing the demos in the summer, and it was like, a, like the song you heard before this one, which is kind mm. of like a fluid bass and a forest. It was just, just going to be used like brushes. Breakfast cereal with coconut brushes. Forest is just on brushes. It's almost kind of, it would be like an entirely acoustic album. In fact, tonight my touchstones were Nick Drake and um, Van Morrison, like uh, Astral Weeks was like another one. I had like a few, a few records I kind of I was listening to actually, I was thinking folk rock. Yeah, yeah. and Joni Mitchell was another one. I was yeah. kind of all some nice, you know, some unusual chord changes for us, just like to try, like expanding a little bit into like an acoustic area. I thought I could really go with that's how I felt in the summer. I was just, yeah. Be nice to sort of sit next to an hour's worth of that. Um, and then all this sort of happened with Boris, and, and then I started doing these demos, and it's not really as a reaction to, to Boris, but suddenly there was like all this like weird music coming in, and like there was that, you know, it's like pop song, it's like machine music, and I thought, oh, here we go, it's, it's all running out of control again. <laughs> and the third lot of demos that we did without Boris was actually quite revelatory because we were used just like machines to. To, to run the percussion and stuff, mm -hmm. and it's like compl we've got like three lots of demos. We were one um, towards the end, in fact, one exactly a year ago to see if we should start thinking about doing another record because I'd got I thought what was a really good, what I thought was a really good song. And we did some in the summer, and then we did some just before we came here, and they're all completely different. So it's just like a complete mix. I think the record's going to turn into like a, a very Strange mix of songs. Um, that there's like a couple of them that are just keyboards. So it's not going to like no bass, like the no album guitar. That you no, it won't be anything like ever. it. I mean, <laughs> disintegration was. Disintegration was. Yeah. yeah, that's the only one. Yeah. That was what? That was how I imagined it would be. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't let anyone change it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, with this one, there's just so so much stuff. I mean, we've demoed about 50 songs and we've recorded 23 so far. And, and of those 23, there's certainly, there's, there are sort of five or six that definitely have a feel to them. 
and I could still turn it into the album I wanted wanted it to be if I did like another five or six in that vein. But then, like I was saying earlier about light and shade, I wouldn't be able to use a song like that. I think, well, why? You know, what, 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 what am I trying to achieve? It's like well, you have that to song that will make like the song before it work because I mean, the song before it's good. Like, I mean, there's some songs where there's a couple of like, eight minute songs, mm-hmm. and by the end of it, you sort of, and you need something like that to mm-hmm. see things sort of, and then you're ready for like the next bit. You try and put two eight minute songs together, and like, but very few people can pull it off. You've either got to be an extraordinary, you know, good guitarist or whatever, you've got to be like a virtuoso to kind of hold someone's attention, or you've just got to build on a mood. And I, and I you have to like want to do that to pull that kind of music off. You have to like feel right, and I, I don't feel like doing that sort of music. Mm. We did that on, on the Wish album, that's like the couple of songs that we haven't, you know, of, of these two hour jams, there's stuff in there that's kind of just like, you know, it's almost not there. And you can hear us chatting, but one of us is sort of keeping playing, and, it's, and it gradually picks up, mutates, moves on. It's like, it's, it's really good. It's just, it's just like a communal music, and it was something we had never done before, never ever jammed. I'd never allowed us to jam on mm. my fascist rules because jams always deteriorated into mm-hmm. standard fare. Didn't the band tend to jam without you though? Yeah, they'd, when they'd I disappeared. They'd go off into rooms, wouldn't they? <laughs> but what's been the saving, what's been the saving <laughs> ratio is that jam. <laughs> Simon can't jam. He's, I mean, he still can't. You have to like write the notes down for him. Mm. just cannot do it. So it's kind of, in some ways, it saved the group from like endless jamming because it's just too, it's too much trouble. You know? mm. So um, when we jam now, I, I play bass, give him a guitar, give him a, just turn it up. And, uh, <laughs> With <time>. Teddy. <laughs> a song, a song. <laughs> but it's also been quite good on, on this session with them um, having different drummers come in. Mm-hmm. You know, each one of them has been completely different, like, personality-wise, drum-wise. Some have been really up for it, others have been very you know, sort of laid back, mm-hmm. trying to impress, a couple have been very nervous. That's been good. It's kind of expanded the way we've worked anyway because I've had to think about what drummer gets what song to try and, and why and what do I want out of that song. And so it's actually, I'm thinking about the songs in a different way. Normally I just like leave Boris to get on with them and I'd, you know, I'd come down and like listen to his finished drum track and I'd say, I don't like that particularly, but I'll live with it. Whereas this is like I'm, I'm having to be there you know, all the time, kind of encouraging them. Discouraging them from mm-hmm. <laughs> It's a good, but, drum, a good drum sound on that, on that one. The noise is very loud. Yeah, that's um, Mark, who's all about Eve's drummer. Oh, right. sort of half know anyway. Mm-hmm. Incredibly loud drummer, the loudest drummer I've ever met in my life. You could hear him like, down the bottom of the road when he was playing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, very worried. Mm-hmm. We had to kind of cut off but, you know, much earlier with him. But a couple of drums are barely audible in the control room. I like, I, like, I like the sound of it. He's good. Um, where did you go on your honeymoon? I didn't have a honeymoon. You didn't? Because oh, in the paper you had just jetted off on your honeymoon at the end of the wedding. I presume that's something that, that the local newspaper invented because <laughs> because people do jet off on their honeymoon after weddings. We actually <laughs> we, we jetted off to... Um, <coughs> we stayed in the same hotel the night before as the night after. Right. We were the last to leave our wedding. It's the only way to do it. <laughs> That's not <laughs> traditional, Robert. <laughs> well, you know I mean? You're supposed like, to slip quietly. I laid in, like all the all the music was on on video cassette and stuff. I kind of I thought I'm not going to miss it. I even had like the last song planned. I thought That's it. It was all timed so that the last song could because they wouldn't serve us drinks after two in the morning. So the last song went on. But that was it. I was away. Everyone mm. waited till our car had gone and everyone followed. It. Um, no, then we went to my mum and dad's the next day, stayed there for the night, and then we went home. Well, I mean, it was a honeymoon because we'd, we'd moved in to a new house, to the new house. so it was right. like, yeah, by the sea. It was so you didn't feel the, the need to go away and have a, a break? Well, as you can imagine, like, doing, doing this is like, not going away, so it's really <laughs> excellent. <laughs> right. Um, we were just about to start recording, the other thing. I think I went. I think I had like two days in the new house, and then went down to Boris's. Actually, yes. Well, because I got confused about um, again. It's funny you get all these cuttings, and you think it's all going to make sense, but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. You read a bit, say, "Well, where does that fit in? You know, what, why doesn't that end up with that?" Um, there, there was a holiday that you went on to south, south of Dublin. Yeah. And that was before you got married. Hmm. 
where you, where you well, sat and watched the sea and from 80, and it didn't feel good. 87, 86. I should know this, it was all, all the court cases all about this. Um, at some point in 86, I think it was, I decided to take a year out. So, in fact, it must have been... Well, it's 86 is pretty much it was, the last book came. No, it was it? December 86, actually, we signed a new contract with Polydor. That's what all the court case was about. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was advised that if I could manage to stay out of the country for 10 months out of the following 12, mm -hmm. I would be entitled to uh, not pay tax. Oh, right, yeah. One of those scams. And uh, so we were touring for like seven months, so I had to kind of find... Somewhere to be somewhere for to be three months. And then um, you can only stay in, in Aero for like three months and then you have to start paying them tax on it. So, so I just I moved into this house with this woman and this bloke for three months. Where was it? And Mary came over to visit me. Uh, it was just south of Dublin in a mm. place called Dolkey. She was very, a very nice lady. Dolkey, yeah. oh, it was a very nice house. Um, I just used to kind of get the ferry backwards and forwards. You're only allowed a certain number of days. This, one yeah, sixth of the time yeah, yeah. that you've had out, sort of thing. So I had to, because I think so, cause Simon Carroll were getting married, so I had to kind of time, so that because I was best man, I had, to, I had to have enough time left to go to be back for that. And um, so Mary was with me up until their wedding, and then we came back, and then I went back on my own, and I stayed there on my own for about a month. I don't know why, actually. I why she come back out with me and ask her. <laughs> Why do you come on this <laughs> we, oh, we are these things banging in your room tonight, we know what's happening. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right, 87. That, that, I've, got it, I've got it as being sort of around about July 87, which is like two week holiday now. Yeah, but well it was like, a, it, it turned into, I mean like, we made it into a holiday, kind of because otherwise it would have felt like an you know, enforced exile sort of thing. I was just hoping. The thing was, that it, I was never really taking it that serious. I thought if anything goes wrong, you know, like if it was like illness in the family or anything like that, I was going to go home. I, was, I wasn't. And I told like, my accountant that he's going, oh, you can't. Go. Please don't get to month nine. I said, but how can I? I'm not. I don't want anything to happen. But if it yeah. does, then I have to come home. So it will all be wasted. But we we kind of spent seven months touring around the world, so it wasn't any big deal. Mm -hmm. And in fact, staying in was quite nice, it was a break, and there was no phone in the house. I had to phone the office from the call box at the station when I wanted to speak to them, which was about once a week. So mm. it, was, it was perfect. And that, just that Irish place of life, over a period of three months, I, kind of, I really chilled out. And I was, <laughs> That's a California term, you're not allowed to use that. Have <laughs> you been tired on the top? No. Well, I kind of chilled out, but virtually the fact of drinking like eight pints of Guinness. Mr. Guinness. Mr. Guinness. The other thing I like about Ireland. It's, it's an incredibly lively music scene almost anywhere in Ireland. Yeah, although I didn't... People playing in... I went to... That's it, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I didn't go into Dublin at all, but I went to uh, um, this one pub in Dolky that had like live music every night. Mm. And you used to go there and just like, mm, sit, at the, sit at the back table. I mean, you, usually country and western songs or whatever, but... It's true, but, but there's music to... everywhere in Ireland. Everywhere. Music. Yeah. The best thing about it is that, this, that I, I remember in the interval, People would have brought along, you know, just like a guitar or a squeeze box or something, and they would fill the interval with music, and they'd say, oh, "Quiet, quiet," you know, and the main act would be back on. Right? And it was all just felt really natural. Well, punters would just yeah, like no one was showing off. Really, it was yeah. just kind of they were just like they didn't want the music to stop. There's no jukebox, and so they're kind of like filling the, the, the gap. We've got, a, good. we've got a pub near us in Pusey where people can just go along on a Tuesday night, take the guitars and sing. <laughs> and they all sit around a fire. It's really nice. Yeah. Good atmosphere. But uh, oh yeah. You should go. <laughs> I'm not good at doing things. Like I know. I'm teasing. Was it when you were in Ireland that you can you remember that you read Sartre's Road to Freedom trilogy? I think that's a very specific question. Yeah. I only I only want to know because because I do want to try and relate books to periods. Yeah. If I can. I just, I just think from something well, that they, I read that that, that was probably one soul. of them. What are they? I can't remember the name. Mm. Yeah. I am in the soul or the other two? I can't I don't remember. I don't know what they're all called. I haven't, I haven't read it. Um, I really don't know. I mean, I, I remember t I had a suitcase of books that I took to Ireland with me, and that's what I did. It was just like went and sat on the rocks and read books. Right. I tried to read all the books that I felt I'd, and that people thought I had read. 
and you, I felt I should have read. Can you remember any of them that you did read? <laughs> um, well, they're probably like, they're, it probably was it. I, mean, I remember reading a lot of books that I didn't enjoy, so I'd imagine that I read Rose of Freedom on that particular trip. I, I didn't really enjoy it. I know, no, I actually, I do know what I read in, in you know, I read the complete works of Nietzsche in, in Dolby. Um, you know, red and black, whatever it is, and Beyond Good and Evil. And, oh, That's right, you mentioned Beyond Good and Evil at the same t- the same interview that you mentioned Road to Freedom, so you pro- yeah, yeah, probably... Yeah, it was all around the same time. I was just kind of wading through the, you know, to try and make sense of them. Um, who was right and who was wrong? Because I know I, I, I was given a book that was called something like uh, Great Philo- Philosophy of, like, uh, of the Modern Age or something, and it had like a short piece at the front about philosophy up to like the, the 19th century, and then detailed chapters on what they consider to be the main uh, philosophical giants since like 1820, some arbitrary time started off by someone who was like completely unintelligible to me, his, his thoughts on the earth. It's all to do with water and, and uh, very bizarre stuff. Um, I remember reading through and trying and com- comparing, and actually making notes, like I was back at school in the margin, and, and, like, having a notepad and trying to make sense, of trying to like, just web of like, thought and who sort of got there. And I realised that, uh, uh, that I'd only attempted to read Beyond Good and Evil when I was at school and I hadn't liked it. Just, I just thought it, was like, it didn't say anything to me as opposed to like Camus or Sartre, which I actually genuinely enjoyed. And so I read all of Nietzsche, and then I realised I hadn't read the, the, um, anything by Sartre apart from like his book books like Nausea, and, which which are really good. And I and I did read Rose of Freedom because I thought it was pretty awful. I, I didn't think it compared at all. In fact, I'm just about to start rereading Nausea. I've got that upstairs. That's one of my notes and stuff. I just, I just, I think it's quite, it's very you, I mean the whole reading books, a lot of you grows out of things that you read and think, you yeah. think about, and I think it's quite important you know, to say that when you were in that place, like on that tour, the books you had with you were such and such, I just, I just like that. Well I think, I mean, you could probably, if I, if I should be bothered I suppose, I could just probably trace a line lyrically from Certainly from like also Sprach Zarathustra through to something on disintegration, there's bound to be something on yeah. it. It's like... You can think of it. I, try, I mean, if I dig out my, my copies of them, I, I always bend like the bottom corner, this mm. corner page down to like something of interest, make yeah. it a new sort of thing. Like this is just like a phrase. I mean, I don't, I don't feel bad about nicking phrases. Mm. This is like bork at nicking entire ideas from people, but... Mm. Yeah, I mean, he, he, I, I still, I mean, he's a really good writer. I just like very s- sceptical of what he writes about. Yeah, it's like he's br- brilliant like, the way he puts things together, brilliant composition. But it's like, you just get kind of you, you start reading things. I would be sitting there on the rocks and I'd read, and I get to the end of the chapter and I'd shut the, the book up and I'd look out and say, "What the bloody hell am I doing reading this?" <laughs> <laughs> and I just stop now. Just... Are you one of these people who has to read to the end of a book? I mean, if you start a book, do you? I have never not got to the end of a book, doesn't okay. matter what it is. So I'm very kind of wary of picking up books that haven't either been recommended by people that I can trust or they've been given to me that the people that I can trust or that I kind of have you know, read a good review by someone that I can trust. Because I know if I pick up a book and I just start reading the first page, that's it. I mean, it's like... Because like, there's, there's a thing upstairs, this, um, this boy sent me a, his first book, and it's about five times as thick as this, and I've had it now for about three months, and on the first page inside, written in Byron, it says, like, I know that you won't start reading, so I know you'll never read it, because if you read the first page, you'll be forced to read to the end, and you think it's going to be shit, that's it, isn't it? Mm. and he's right, because I've kind of like, <laughs> I just like, looked at the first couple of sentences and thought, no, 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 no. no. Somebody know about this, yeah. But I can't throw it away, I've still got it there, because he wants it to be, he thinks I should start a publishing company for because struggling young writers who are cure fans and that, and they'd all buy each other's works and then I'd get the money back to them. Just like that nice Paul Weller. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a sort of logic to it. <laughs> yeah. Cure fan series, he goes, as long as I'm number one. You've obviously not got enough to do with your money, so... Yeah. Was there any truth in the theory that in 1987, when you started the American tour, you had to be barricaded into your hotel on the first night and hire 12 sumo bodyguards? Or did you make this lie up? Did I say that? I say no, that. no, you didn't say it. It was reported. 
It was reported in a, in a fairly down market tabloid, like the Mirror or something like that. Yeah, I think, um, I can't remember arriving in 1987. It ran to catch and just been released in England as a single. Yeah, the 1987 Kiss Me Tour of America was quite a, a, um, a hysterical tour, all in all, as I remember. I mean, you would remember having 12 sumo bodyguards. No, I, don't think yes. <laughs> I definitely don't remember that. Well, I wouldn't actually, because I'd be the other side of the door and I'd be completely oblivious to it. <laughs> so, what, somebody else might have hired them without telling you. Yeah, I just think there's like a lot of people in the corridor. And I'm looking through the spy yeah, and I'm thinking about any minute they just look big anyway, wouldn't they? <laughs> there's a lot of men in nappy outside. It's yeah. right, nothing new there. <laughs> it's the American <laughs> sex convention. You're staying in the cruise hotel, it's like. Do you regret like that all the time? <laughs> okay, no, it's just one of these stories that I think has to be cleared up. Uh, Perry might remember, because he was on the crew for that, so he's probably better to remember right. anecdotal material from that tour. As long as I coach him to be very careful about what he does and doesn't remember. Right. <laughs> um, that, was also, that was also the tour on which you, you played Madison Square Garden, but was it the tour on which the doorman at Madison Square Garden didn't actually recognise you, the band, didn't, didn't know who the band were, which is something that you did say in an interview. You so that, well, it must have been because we've only played there once. Yeah. Can you remember the incident? I mean, can you actually remember the doorman not knowing who you, who you I, were? I remember at arriving at the... Um, it was one of these interviews... I remember it being difficult to get, get back stuck. We actually got into like a holding area and he would, this bloke wouldn't let us into the dressing room and... Mary's cousin, this blonde-haired girl, she's really like a brassy bottle blonde. You know, it's, it's like that, comes from Doncaster. And she appeared from behind this huge boat and said, No, it's all right, that's him. And that was like one of those surreal moments. I'd only ever met her once in my life at a wedding. I kind of dimly thought, well, That's Mary's cousin. What's Mary's cousin doing Do in you? our dressing room in <coughs> Madison Square Gardens? And she was there on her own and she'd made a sandwich from like, the, the rider. And she'd opened a can of beer and she was like sitting there chatting to this enormous security bloke. And he thought that she was like the artiste of the evening. Wonder. And like she was letting us in. Yeah. I remember walking in. And everyone were kind of like, no one said anything because they all thought, well, she must be something to do with Robert. She's like, you know, she talks in the right voice. She's like one of his family. Like. And I, I just like sat there and I said to her, her name's Carmen. I said, Carmen, how did you get back here? She goes, I, I, I don't know. She goes, I just kept walking through and everyone was just letting me through. I kept saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm cure, I'm cure, I'm with cure. And they just thought that she was, she, like, was, the she was an artist called, you know. Cure, yeah. Because we were just, we were really? just reaching a kind of level there. Where, well, we hadn't reached a level there where people knew we were, yeah. really. And How she'd got all the way into the inner sanctum. Yeah. When you say you hadn't expected her to be there, I mean, did you even know that she was in America? No, no, she was there on holiday. You, and what, and just turned up? Yeah. It was her last oh, yeah. night there, and she just like so. And she'd actually she'd left her friends in a bar and come there on her own mm-hmm. to ask me if she could get some tickets for the show. Right. <laughs> and had managed to get all the way through. Yeah, so, so much, she is so one of those security. girls that, that could yes. do that. You know, yeah. she's just like. So the guy's giving you a hard time. Yeah, but well, it's only her say well, something gets that gets you in. <laughs> so they're okay. There's a classic moment. We've got like, an entourage like ten of us, like, yeah. and big Brian with this. What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> Oh, I liked your imitation of him quite a bit. <laughs> but this bloke was seriously big, I mean, bigger than Brian. Yes, oh, that's It was like a double door sized man. <laughs> um. They're very, in a place like that, they're very, in fact, more fanatical than they are in some of the much bigger places on the so Madison Square right. Gardens. Like the people that run it, very oh, proud right. yeah. to be working for Madison Square Gardens. It's got kind of a prestige, whereas like other, even bigger venues, people are much more kind of like less effort. Mm-hmm. There's so many people wandering about backstage at like a football stadium that they, they give up. Mm-hmm. You know? There's like yeah. 30 different kinds of laminate, so they just don't bother. You know? If you're wearing anything that glints, it's like you get through. <laughs> Oh, there are certain places, aren't there, which have a certain prestige about them. Madison Square is one of them, mm. Carnegie Hall, places like that. They, yeah. have, a, they have a thing about it. Um, in, in about, in the we same played in Mexico, and we weren't allowed backstage in Mexico because we, had, we were told we had the wrong laminates. There were so many bootleg laminates that the real laminates were considered to be the fakes. Oh, classic, right? classic Mexico. Where was it? that in Mexico? Uh, no, yeah. where, where in Mexico then? Um, was that on that same tour? or No, that was on, that was on the Wish Tour, wasn't it? 
we went to Mexico the first known new time. Was it, but you were like close to Texas, right? Yeah, it wasn't Mexico City, it was the one, what's the other big town? Is it? Chihuahua. There's something about it. El Paso, no, it's Texas. It's Texas. Monterey. Monterey. Monterey, it happened in. Yeah. But it's, it's Mexico City, just living there, like one day there is the equivalent to smoking two packs a day. Mm. That's just bizarre. There were about s sort of six or seven hundred people in this backstage area. It was like a football stadium. And they were all wearing these fake laminates. And there was only like, you know, like our little entourage, sort of ten of us with like the real McCoy. And the bloke wouldn't let us in. And it's only sort of like dimly became aware that we were like talking in the you know yeah. in a foreign language and mm. we just arrived on a fucking humongous bus that maybe we just <laughs> were who we could. And so then they proceeded to try and round up all these other people with fake memories and they spent about five minutes in and thought, oh no, no, it doesn't matter. So then they just like barricaded us into this into the men's toilets and everyone else just carried on as normal. It's like it was really it bizarre. Happened to toilets anyway. Yeah, but this was actually in the Uranus. The real yeah. <laughs> The only place with one door in the one door And if we weren't barricaded there, well, there's no way we could go to the toilet. So, right. like, yeah. so it was the best place to be. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, they had, they'd been packing people into this stadium from about two o'clock in the afternoon, and all, all the sanitation had like, gone, all the water had run out. Sort of thing. Oh, it was Mexico just too many people there, it was all blocked up. It absolutely stank when we went on stage. It was almost enough to make you heave. It's like, 40,000 people. So, are you going to go there again? No, there's no go there. There's some gorgeous bits of Did you go down south in Mexico at all? No, no that's as far as we got. Oh. We did spend, I mean, we drove, um, we, we drove around, but um, we never really got far enough away from the urban centre. Not like in Brazil, I mean, we never actually went out and saw the country because mm. we just kind of like, we headed down there, we played, we came back. But um, I mean, it was a very interesting three days, but not, not really three days I'd like to experience. To repeat again? You should go to the to the Yucatan down south. I mean, it's it's fabulous. You'd love it. Well, anybody would love it. Yeah. So we didn't have enough time we, I mean, because we were doing it by bus. The others yeah. weren't prepared to spend the extra two weeks to drive all the way down. Could you use the I got hit by something on stage. Was the other thing, so by a door handle. So in Monterey or in Mexico? In Monterey. Mm. I just remember like thinking. I remember seeing this object come through, and just at the last minute, I moved my head back and then. Sort of like being going, everything going black for a couple of seconds and coming to kind of like staggering about. Did you actually, did you actually fall face. down or? No, yeah. just like, I sang the next line. I only missed one line. <gasps> Mr. Trooper. Yeah. Yeah. Great photo of me after, so it looked like blood cake. Show goes on. Cheek. Really hard. Unfortunately, the line he sang was from I'd like to teach the world to sing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was a line. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see her. <laughs> He set it up. I think, if I'm right, it was it was all to do with the Canaan Arab scandal, and um, I think it was in aid of homeless Arabic and, and Jewish American children, half and half to you, each. You, you just you just been through a all disclaimer, that. and I'd had to go like tell the Arab and Arab communities it was nothing to case. Okay. So, but then we couldn't just give the money to homeless Arab children. But no, it was Arab orphans in New York. We had to do it to Jewish orphans in New York as well. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd have them on our backs. The the excellent concert that was actually. Yeah. I think it was the last night of the tour. I remember not completely ratted. But, uh, and Lol did his famous solo version of Wild Thing, I gather. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just purely for our amusement. Yeah. The crowd just didn't have a clue what was what occurring. Was going on? <laughs> but it didn't matter by that time. I remember we sat, just sat outside in a minibus for about three hours before that concert, just drinking. Mm. 
mm-hmm. like listening to music on the, on the stereo because the club is just so packed and like, you know the Ritz is like the backstage area is like that, like that corner we just couldn't face the prospect of going yeah, so we just basically went just straight from the van onto the stage mm-hmm. and so it was really, really why were you there three hours before I mean had you been rehearsing that earlier or something um no, it's just like to, we wanted to go to. We always, well, I always like to get there early, like Simon does as well, to kind of get a feel for the place, and like mm-hmm. see what the mood's like, see what the crowd's like, see what you've got to expect, and you know, see if you're going to have to work hard. See what the van's hard. like. <laughs> see what the van's <laughs> like. <laughs> but um, it was just so packed already that, that we didn't bother going in. Mm-hmm. But it was a good gig. I remember it being quite funny. I remember sitting down on stage watching Long Doing Wild thing. What did you Just chatting do? with people in the front row. What wild he, thing. It's he's saying it. At certain points in our, at low points in our career, he has sung wild thing on stage. Yeah. Three times, I think, he's done it in total. And never again. What, what, I, I, I've never actually seen this event. I mean, what, what is significant about it? What, well, it's just abysmally awful. Because <laughs> all he knew was like wild thing, <laughs> hard sin, <laughs> everything. Uh, groovy, <laughs> and then he could never get down, 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 down. He'd always come and sing it at the wrong. He would go down, down. You make it go now. Oh, it's like <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, it, it just it was funny for us because it it, it highlighted his lack of timing, mm. which is why we liked it. Mm. Lots of gaps in it, lots of stops. Rage would have been proud of him, I dare say. Yeah. It was probably the way they did it as well. Um, and it was shortly after that, it was in, I think it was in September that Roger joined. Was it? Uh, Boom. 87. 87. Uh, and he'd just come from a stint with the first. I thought Roger joined earlier than that, I think. Well, again, this isn't entirely clear from what I've got. But no, Roger definitely joined earlier than that. Roger, I think you gave me Roger's number anyway. So Roger joined for the Kiss Me Tour, because Kiss Me Tour, Roger was on it. Right. All of it. So he, he joined actually in Dublin while I was still in Dublin, because we had the tour rehearsals in Dublin in about the, probably the April, April 87. The first thing Roger did with us, I think, was April or May 87. He was through with, he was with us throughout that year. So I don't know where I got that from. I got that from the Guinness... Um who rock stars book or whatever it's called. They have, they have yeah, there's a lot of misinformation yeah. about Roger Jenner and everything that's been written about us. Mm. People kind of muddy up that time. Because the, the, the reason why, why Roger was brought into the group is because Lowell couldn't play any of the keyboard lines on the Kiss Me album, so we had to get someone to play keyboards. That's why I know that he was... And we, and we finished recording that. And we, did, we did the cut in February of 87. Mm. So it must have been between February and May of 87 that Roger joined. In fact, he came and did a, he did a, I think it was the tube he did with us or something, one of those programs. I'm not even going to have to read the book. To know oh, you're just going to get it all right here. <laughs> You've got it all the time. <clears throat> Can you remember if that, if that was around the time, that at the end of that tour, that you decided that you were going to do a solo album? Or had that idea been around for a lot longer? A lot longer. The, 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 when I was originally going to do a solo album was actually when Simon left the group. When we ended up doing Let's Go to Bed and The Walk and those songs. We did, I actually did demo four songs that I've still got on a tape for my solo album. So that's when the whole thing started. Because I've got now about two hours worth of stuff. Most of it actually, I reviewed it before we came here. It's pretty turgid. I don't think I'm going to use it. I sort of think, I, 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 at the time, I liked the idea of it because it was very kind of like small and, and you know, naive and kind of like inconsequential, just didn't mean anything to anyone else and I didn't want it to. But now I sort of, it would be contrived for me to do that because I'm not, I'm not the same person. Really. So they just sort of, I think those songs are just there. But I think from time to time through the years, I've, I've kind of like had a dissatisfaction with the group, whether with the, whether it be with the lineup or like my part within the group, or how I perceive like my, my role in the group, and I just throw out the idea of a solo album to kind of shock people. So mm, saying, like, I can do it on my own. You know, it's there. Get back in line. <laughs> <laughs> it's my cracking of the whip. It's a solo album. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
oh yes, okay, yes. <laughs> yes, we will play in full full time. Play it that way, yeah. Play it that way, or, or I'll release the sword. Um, now, here's a really vital question. Just before you went off on the European tour at that point, Just Seventeen magazine revealed that your essential travel kit included crimson sculpture Mary Quant lipstick. Is that right? No. It wasn't crimson sculpture. Crimson sculpture. Scorcher. See, I don't know. Scorcher. And I still use it. I thought some of these things sounded wrong. Um, all my eye pencils and something called M.Y. Mickham's hair gel. I'm not, I mean, I'm not a great user of hair gel, so I wouldn't know, but Mickham's doesn't sound to me like a... No, I can't remember what it was called, but I used it at the time. I'll just it say hair a, gel. We'll just say hair yeah. gel. It had a hexagonal design on the front and it said things like PH14, you know, it's like dead scientific. Oh, yeah. It's just, just like glue, basically. I'm not, I'm not really blue glue, excellent. Do you have some of that? We can fix the painting. No, I now use a different. <laughs> I use green glue. Now. I don't know what it's called. Either L'Oreal, I use now. Oh, you look. <gasps> Animal testing. Is it? Yeah. It's the only stuff that stays up on stage. Mm. I tested it on myself. Cool. It ran into my own eyes, Jane. I promise <laughs> you, the stuff that didn't work. <laughs> I can tell that they tested it on animals because this stuff runs into my eyes and it doesn't hurt. I used to use that makeup I know, this, this is going fully very flat with you, I know, good chance. <laughs> <laughs> I love all these things that you get in. <laughs> You're going to have so protesters. Nice. Robert Smith, I'm going to let it out. <laughs> you have the pet of protesters. Um, let's uh, move ahead here um, to October, uh, European tour starting in Oslo and then Stockholm. I mean, do you have any particular memories of that tour? Um, what the Kiss Me tour? Yeah. No, it's actually, yeah. Yeah. Me, no, that's right, yes, the Kiss Me tour. It started in Oslo. I mean, you, you talked, I mean, you talked here about. Um, Where are you now? I'm on page two at the moment. Yeah. Halfway down about, about getting up at 8 in the morning, which I presume from what I read was in Stockholm, and going out and watching people going to work and making you feel good. What have you. Um, does that bring any memories back? Yeah, although I, I, my main memories of the tour was the first tour that we um, started videoing. So we bought a video camera mm -hmm. and Perry would video the audience. I remember all through that whole year. Or was it just the audience research thing? Yeah. Asking audiences? Yeah. Of, of, of sitting backstage watching the audience. Like Perry would come in at half an hour before the show and kind of put it on fast forward through the boring bits and say, oh, this person's got something good to say, you know. And it was really good. Like, it would get all, the whole group round. You know, That's what I'll it. do on the next tour. And we talked about you know, <laughs> that would be my what job. we were going to do. And it actually like, really helped like, the, the group performance. I suppose because Roger was like a newcomer as well, and I was trying to like, make everyone feel like part, you know, part of a group. Um, so I that he probably felt like, a little bit left, left out. Mm -hmm. um, I just remember that, that it was when Simon constantly tried to make Lola before we would go on stage. Tried to make him up with various oh, types. Make him up, right. He'd always suggested that. Like, Particularly, kind of go, Lowell, this would look really good, but like, really trust me. And Lowell would be, be just on the point of being drunk enough to trust him. I know that you're gonna do something horrible, but go and do it anyway. And he'd like sit there, and Simon would do like, you know, like a V on his nose, or he'd like do really, really heavy eyeliner going down here, like, or he'd accentuate his jowls or something you know, with blusher. <laughs> and just, we would just laugh, you know, it was just one of those sort of the, the, one of those in jokes that the more it was done, the funnier it got. Do you think a lot of that, I mean, because Lowell became the butt of a huge number of jokes, do you think a lot of that was by way of trying to get him to make his own decision to leave? Yeah, I mean, it said a, a, a huge number of jokes, but I think I mean, it was primarily Simon. It was almost exclusively Simon. And, and it stemmed not... Simon's like, war against Lowell. Well, it? it stemmed from when, we, when me and Simon and Lowell were a three-piece, and Lowell was like a normal human and played drums and contributed and understood what was going on and talked lucidly and was a nice person to have around. And when Simon rejoined, Lowell had friends in the city who drove Porsche cars, flashed his money about and was a boring wanker. And Simon, and, and it took like two years for that to happen. Simon came back and was, I, I think it was like born out of kind of, he was utterly distraught at what Lowell had become and his way of battling it, of like, well, combat, and it was just like to have a go at him at all times, at all costs. You know? 
but he did it in a way, it, it was, I mean, a lot of it was, it was like, it's really sort of stupid, it was like banal. Some of it was genuinely surreal humour. I mean, Simon would set up things just so that Lowell was going to get it at the end of it, you know. I mean, so it was all like, just like constant, um, I mean, it, one of them survives to this day where Simon laughs, in the, laughs the theme tune to Hawaii Five. <laughs> I can't, I mean, he's ha 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 and it just gets louder and louder and more manic, closer and closer, the pointing it would get, and at the end, then he'd go, alright, oh, Lowell, and then just walk off, and Lowell would just be like, be, be bemused, as we all were, I don't I have no idea why it was why either, but it's Simon, something had happened, oh, that had Simon. triggered it, like, <laughs> and there were loads of things like, or, uh, things like ta you know, Tattoo from Fantasy Island, it was all like, just like, Trash culture that someone kind of weave in very you know, tenuous links just to have a guy at Lowell. But I mean, but Lowell deserved it really. But it never, it didn't come from anyone else. I mean, Boris would kind of like, if, if Lowell was being like drunk and, and obstreperous and kind of like leering all over him, you know, Boris would just fuck off Lowell. That would be it. That would be Boris being horrible to Lowell. It would be short, sharp, and you know, cheerful. Um, and Paul would cheerful. wouldn't even bother <laughs> saying anything. Paul would just like hit him if he, you know, you know what I mean. But Lowell could be really obnoxious about this. Part of the Bermonti conspiracy that's taking over popular music, <laughs> um, and he, I think, Severin is kind of you know a bit not really envious, but I think he he used to like ridicule me in a, in a sort of half joking way, as all did all the benches about the fact that I would stay, you know, that Mary was my girlfriend and that I led like, a boring conventional kind of existence and I should get out and about all that sort of mm. mentality. And I could never see it. And I said, well, I get the best of both worlds from what I'm doing. So I've got like a best friend that's always the same that I can always talk to. And I think I've ended up kind of, well, I mean, I feel I'm vindicated. You know? And I sort of think that they, well, I mean, Sue and Budgie are married now, so it's like. I don't know, I mean, obviously, watch Ruffler, but I just told them. I was, as a group, well, musically, I just, no, I, just I felt there was a waste of time. I, could, I, could never understand I think Budgie's excellent. Around. I really think but Budgie's a really, really talented boat. I think it's pretty wasted in the matches. Severin's just, uh, I mean, Severin's sort of made a career out of being Severin. Mm. He's, he's, he's all right. He's got, you know, similar kind of chip, though, about talking to people that aren't someone. Mm. I don't know, I just I don't like that mentality. Really. I could put up with it. When I was in the benches, I had to kind of, like, swallow it, you know. Because yeah. otherwise I would have been round all the time. As it was, I just round, like, once a week. <laughs> Because they were always really horrible to Mary. They used to like, I couldn't bear. But they used to do that to wind me up. It was a great pleasure in winding me up. I think that was what I didn't like about it. It didn't seem to me to be appealing people. Didn't, no, they're not really. Didn't, the kind of people you just didn't think you wanted to be around. But I did interview them once and they interviewed Susie and I thought she was completely weird. She's like <laughs> strange sort of, girl. She's one Still. of the most intellectual, pretentious people that I've ever met in my no, life. Yeah, one of the anyway, this, this is irrelevant. Yeah. Let's get back to law. <laughs> what, what, what he was the other. <laughs> <laughs> Another charming soul. Um, was the, what, what I was trying to get at is, was the slagging off of him and, and, the, and the making him the butt of jokes, I mean, was it just that just slagging off for its own sake, or do you think Simon... No, was, everyone was wanted him to, to leave the group. I mean, because there's two, there's two things that occur to me. That, leave the group, yeah. or um, get your act back together and become a human being again. I mean, was the hope that, that he would be pushed into one of those two things? I, I think it was left up to me to get Lowell back to normal, back to being a human being. And it was like, and if Lowell didn't choose that path, it was kind of up to Simon to make sure he left the group. It was that sort of, you know, that was the, that was the balance that was sort of like there. But the thing was, I mean, I used to offer Lowell like counselling and friendship, really, like right the way through to, in fact, even while we were still at, at um, Brushwood doing disintegration stuff, I remember sitting at the table with Lowell there and saying, well, this is really like your last chance. If you don't stop drinking now, you're going to be out of the group whether I want you out of the group or not. Because there isn't going to be a group for you to be in or out because everyone's going to leave. But, I mean, it all but started. Everybody else was threatening to leave. They would have left. Of, yeah. yeah. I mean, if I hadn't thrown light at the group, then the others would, would seriously, after that record had been made, would just have 
gone. They weren't going to go on tour with Lowe again. None of them could say that. Nor could I, really. I mean, but I just thought I'd had more sort of pity than, than the others, I suppose. And I knew, yeah, and I, I knew longer, and I kind of remembered what he was like, and I suppose I deluded myself longer than anyone else that he could become that person again. But um, Simon and was kind of egged on by Paul, really. The making of the videos. Can you remember anything? You were saying how you would sit and watch the videos, and and there would be things on them that were interesting, and you know, people saying interesting. I mean, can you remember any particularly interesting things that the punters said? That appeared on those videos, or was it only interesting at the time? I think it was only interesting at the time mm -hmm. because you were kind of you because you knew those people were like there, but they were only like a hundred feet away through a few walls, and you were going to go out and play to them, and mm -hmm. there they were, just like moments before, and they were like talking. They were talking to the camera, talking to you. They're saying, "Oh, Robert, you know." I'd like this. Um, yeah, I'd like that. Oh, what do you think about this? Oh, I know you'll never get a chance to answer, but like, if you could say something down the line, can you wish so a happy birth? Just really little things, but it was really good to see it. it made you did you do those things? Yeah, because when you went out on stage, you actually felt like you knew some people in the audience, mm -hmm. and it made the whole audience kind of like... Were you, were you ever able to sort of address people by name because of... I used to cheat and take notes out on stage. Yeah. yeah. But actually, I used to give them um, to uh, Jimmy Olsen, the monitor man. <laughs> It's nice real man, needless to say. No! <laughs> and, uh, and Clark Kent, the, uh, the lighting technician. And he would hand me these notes that would say, you know, don't forget to wish. So people would say, oh, he's so charming. And what a memory. Mm. There go. Mm. The traditional thing is to put it on your wrist, isn't it? Yeah, but then it'd be in a photo. Yeah. What's he doing? Why are his <laughs> veins like that? <laughs> yes. But mainly it was just um, Perry would ask them like, what songs that they, they would want to hear that we might not play. Mm -hmm. He'd like, pick out Cure fans, ones that like, obviously looked like Cure fans. Just, uh, um, and we'd try and like, chuck a couple in the encores. It was really th for that, but it kind of developed into this sort of ritual where we'd all get around the telly and, like, and talk about the performance for half an hour. And I found it really, you know, it, it enhanced what we did mm -hmm. an, an awful lot. And, um, I think that sort of when I began to feel Lowell wasn't really part of the group, because Lowell wouldn't do that. He'd just sort of, uh, like, oh, fancy her, you know, it'd be that. And you think, oh, there's Lowell, can you have, come on, you don't need to say it. It's, yeah. uh, it's dead obvious, it's Perry's like, um, having a video conversation with one particular girl for more than five minutes. That no, he's that he, uh, yeah. Deep down, he's thinking, yeah. oh, she's Girl, nice. Isn't but, that nice? Yes. <laughs> thinking, well, why is the ratio of girls to boys always like 90? 90% to 10% and Teddy. Why, you know. why is it always the attractive girls that get on the video? <laughs> no, he was, wasn't like that. He was very fair. In fact, he would stand there and like, anyone that wanted to come up, he would be, you know. Like, you two yeah, took yeah. a stage with him, but actually putting a booth around there, man, with a camera. But, mm. um, no, it's good. I mean, it, it, the thing was that we, could only, we, we had to stop doing it when Perry was, got in the group. This is not, it was because it was Perry doing it. Yeah that people actually would feel at ease and would actually talk to him, you know. He'd kind of hold just off the camera and shoulder and just, I uh, he can talk to anyone. He's never, never seems to be stumped. So it was a value ball run? Yeah, I mean, that's my overriding memory of what, what's made that tour stand out, really. And also the shirts, we were all matching shirts, white shirts with different, we all had a different pattern from the catch sleeve on our shirts. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really cheesy. I was used to like, and that moment of like of everyone putting their white shirt on with their pattern. And we said well, that there was like, you go on stage, yeah, yeah, there was like a good yeah. kind of like in joke about that. Very Reservoir Dogs actually.